forgot you had my full bio, so I was grimacing a little up here. I gotta shorten that thing. Um, great, well, so I'm really excited to be here today. We're gonna get deep into some science. I'll leave a ton of time at the end for question and answer, because I'm sure you guys will have a lot. So let's get started. In the game of cannabinoids. Great, all right, so first, brief outline what I'll be talking about today. So we'll compare, how do, how do we utilize the plant to produce cannabinoids? How can we utilize other formats, whether you're using chemical synthesis in beakers, or are we genetically programming bacteria to produce cannabinoids? Uh, we'll, t we'll talk a bit about the cost, because that's gonna be a huge driver of who's gonna win this, this game of cannabinoids. And we'll talk about some of the potential effectiveness, efficacy, effectiveness. Is it gonna be the same, is it gonna be different, depending on where you source your cannabinoids from, and we'll talk about some of the, the regulatory landscape, which will probably be the most complicated part of this that we need to tease through. So let's get started. I'll first just briefly overview what, how the plant produces cannabinoids. So here's what a plant does, right? So it's taking carbon dioxide out of the uh, atmosphere, and it's fixing that carbon and building sugar is what it's doing, right? And once it's built that sugar, it can then take that sugar and, tran and, and transform it into a variety of other compounds. So what the cannabis plant does is it takes carbon dioxide, it forms sugar, and so from sugar and through a series of steps, which I will just kind of abbreviate, it'll take that sugar, convert it to compound A, then convert it to compound C, then D, then E, then F, and then eventually it's turned into a cannabinoid, dozens of steps later, as outlined in this diagram right here. Don't worry about the details. Literally don't. There's so many enzymatic pathways and intermediate compounds. But just know that eventually that sugar, through a series of steps, A, A B, C, D, E, F, G, Z, is made into CBG. And CBG is the precursor to many cannabinoids. And the way you can remember that is the, the, it's the OG, it's the original cannabinoid that then is made into THC, CBD, et cetera. Okay, and the reason this becomes important is when we start talking about how you can make bacteria produce cannabinoids, you gotta figure out where in this sequence of steps can I utilize the bacteria to uh, produce, to, to do those steps. And also keep in mind that this is not happening in a vacuum. So the cell in the plant, or any cell for that matter, it's like a little city. And parts of that cell are dedicated to producing energy. So it's like the, the local coal plant producing energy for the entire uh, cell. Other parts of the cell are factories. They're producing certain things. In the case of certain cannabis cells, they're producing cannabinoids, right? Uh, but there's also parts of the city that are used for defense, for, for all of this stuff. So it's a very complicated uh, landscape. And so, but what if there's a way that we could just take the factories making cannabinoids and take advantage of that one piece in the cell? And I'll talk more about that uh, down the road. The other thing about cannabinoid production in the cannabis plant, I'm sure as you all realize, is it is not optimized throughout the entire growth phase of the cannabis plant. You really only get robust cannabis production, or cannabinoid production in a very specific part of the cannabis plant, right, the, 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 fl the floral parts, and only in unfertilized female flower. Uh, so it's not optimal. That means you're kind of wasting all this time in the plant phase where it's not producing the real compound you're interested in. So how do we optimize that? And furthermore, it's only stored in this one small part of the plant, in the trichromes. It's not stored throughout the plant. So now, not only are you limited to this kind of time cycle of the plant, you're really only limited to a certain portion of the plant. And the reason cannabinoids are stored in trichromes is, number one, they're uh, fat-soluble, so that they can't really exist in the aqueous you know, leaf uh, parts of the cannabis plant, and they're actually toxic to the plant. That's why they're stored in these protective little bulbous orbs. Okay. All right, this will all become more important in a second. Now, when you try to do an extraction from the cannabis plant, you actually have to spend a lot of time and energy to get rid of all the other unwanted compounds. So when you do an initial extraction of the cannabis plant, <clears throat> you're basically pulling things based on their chemical properties. So yes, you pull cannabinoids, but at the same time, you're gonna pull a bunch of other stuff from the plant because that other stuff has similar properties, chemical properties to the cannabinoids. And so you're gonna pull chlorophyll, you're gonna pull uh, plant lipids and waxes, you're gonna pull other cannabinoids, you're gonna pull flavonoids and all this junk. And then you have to go through all of these steps to get rid of all of that uh, extra junk and that's gonna create a lot of cost. So how efficient is it when we use the plant and we're just interested in a handful of compounds? We have to spend all this time and energy 
getting rid of all the other stuff that came along for the ride in the initial extraction. So how do we optimize for that? OK, so that's putting that aside for a second. Let's talk about some of the chemical, or the synthetic processes, the non-cannabis plant processes that you can make cannabinoids. So there's chemical synthesis, where you're building things in beakers. You're not using living systems. Then there's cellular biosynthesis, where you're genetically engineering cells to produce cannabinoids. Then there's cell-free biosynthesis, where you don't even need the cell. You don't need the whole city. I just want the one factory in that city that makes cannabinoids. How do I harness that? And I'll walk you through each one of these. OK, so chemical synthesis, you have you know, beakers. You don't have any living organisms. And you're just basically uh, building one molecular building block at a time. You're rebuilding your cannabinoid. The cannabinoid is a pretty complicated molecule. And so for all intents and purposes, chemical synthesis might not be the most cost efficient way to do this. Also, it's not the most sustainable because all of the reagents you have to use at each step of your chemical synthesis, these are things that you can't dispose of very readily. Um, and furthermore, this can be very inefficient. So when you're trying to each step of this process, you end up actually creating a lot of similar but non-identical compounds. So then you still have to go through filtration and separation and all of this stuff. Um, so um, for the rest of this talk, I'm not going to talk about this too much because I don't think this is the future of cannabinoid production from both a cost standpoint, a sustainability standpoint. What gets much more interesting is biosynthesis. So the same way that the cannabis plant takes sugar, walks it through a series of steps to produce a cannabinoid, we could engineer a cell uh, that exists in a bioreactor, and that cell can also take a sugar and walk it through those same steps and output a cannabinoid. And then I don't have to deal with growing this plant and all of this stuff, OK? Now, before I talk more about this, let's talk about the history of uh, cellular biosynthesis. Is it working? Did it fall asleep? There we go. So prior to the 1960s, the way that we treated diabetics was that we would take animal pancreas, mainly pig pancreas, uh, we'd grind it up, and we'd extract the insulin out of the pancreas. And then we'd go through a very complicated series of steps of extraction and purification, not too different than what we do with cannabis, to produce roughly purified insulin. But it wasn't very pure. It wasn't very consistent. You would give it to patients, and sometimes you would create sometimes lethal uh, reactions to it because batch to batch it was different. The porcine pancreases, just like cannabis plants, are different batch to batch. And you really only wanted one molecule, the insulin. But all this extra stuff came along for the ride when you did your extraction. So you had to spend all this time purifying all that other stuff out. So in the 60s, they figured out a better way to do this. Uh, and it was Genentech. And this is what made them a, 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 a billion dollar company. So they said, OK, let's figure out what is the actual DNA strand in the human pancreas cell that's responsible for insulin production? Let's take out that piece of DNA and let's stick it in a bacteria. And then when we boot up the bacteria, lo and behold, it starts producing insulin. So they basically took, uh, if you, one way to think about this is they took, um, they took the code, they took the code that codes for, if this is like c computer software code, they took the code that codes for insulin out of the human cell, put it into a different you know, computer, and then booted up that computer. And that computer is now reading that code and doing what that code is instructing. And that's how we got insulin. And so then we never needed to use animal pancreases again. So this was, in, this was 50 years ago. So this is not new technology, biosynthesis, biosynthetic production of compounds. All right, now let's take this one step further uh, and so these are some of the companies that have popped up to try and do this. There's a lot of companies working in this space. Yeah. Uh, next one, next one. Okay, so what, you know, in theory this sounds simple, but I think there's a lot of nuances in how companies are gonna go about doing this. So first, Uh, what type of microorganism are they going to use? Is it going to be bacteria? Is it going to be a fungi? Is it going to be algae? 
And each, back, each type of microorganism has its own peculiarities. What food you need to feed it, what temperature does it grow well at, things like that. How easy is it to insert your DNA into that microorganism? Uh, what, yeah, exactly, what, uh, no, input and output. So are you feeding it sugar? And that organism has been genetically engineered to take sugar all the way down to cannabinoid through dozens of steps? Or are you feeding it an intermediary compound? So rather than feeding it A and having it transform it to Z, are you feeding it like Q and it can take it to Z? But then you have to go spend time and energy creating Q, right? Ideally, you'd be able to give it sugar and take it all the way through, but that's gonna be very tough because of all the steps involved. So it might be that you create a moderately expensive intermediate compound and then have the cell take it all the way through. And the last one. Uh, and then, you know, do these cells keep all the contents inside of them? Or can you engineer them to then you know, kick out the cannabinoids once they're done? Because then it's even easier to, for you to, to get a hold of it. It's just floating in the aqueous material. You don't have to lyse the cells, burst the cells open to get the compound of interest. OK, take it a step further. Remember, the analogy I said about the city. So in the previous example, we're saying, why don't we rebuild an entire cellular city with its own life support system, its own hospitals, and gardens, and roads, and all of this stuff, and cannabinoid factories? Or what if we just take advantage of the one cannabinoid factory in the city and ditch the city? And so that's what uh, one of our faculty at UCLA has been working on. So again, traditionally, so instead of building the city, he just focuses on, oh, now it's working. Uh, it's called cell-free biosynthesis. He just takes the enzymes the cellular factories for cannabinoids, puts those in a bioreactor, and he's theoretically able to produce cannabinoids. This is still really, really early proof of concept stuff. It's gonna be years before it's, it will know if it's viable at scale, but people are working on this. And again, the, the advantages are now you no longer have to deal with the cells. So not only have we, so we've jumped from plant to you know, bacteria in a bioreactor, but that bacteria is still fickle. It produces waste products. Right? It needs, uh, and you need to feed it sugar to keep it alive. It produces all sorts of other stuff. Uh, now, we, let's get rid of the cell. Let's just have the factory. And then it's just super, it only produces one thing, and there's no waste products. It only produces cannabinoids. You don't really need to feed it sugar to keep it alive. And so, based off that, he's created a spin out company, InVesign. All right. So, to sum it up, what are the kind of advantages and disadvantages of this approach? So first off, you, you, you could actually argue that this is more environmentally sustainable than growing the cannabis plant. You don't need lots of arable land. You don't need lots of water. You don't need fertilizer. You don't need to uh, spend all this time and energy to grow the plant to only extract out a small portion of it and then purify that. It could be potentially cheaper. I'll talk more about that later. It's a lot easier to scale. So if I have a 100-acre cannabis farm and I want to 10x my output, how, how quickly can I go from a 100-acre cannabis farm to a 1,000-acre cannabis farm? That might take me a couple years to ramp up that capacity. But if you're growing enough of your synthetic creatures in a 10-liter bioreactor, the, you could scale in a couple months. I just buy 10 other bioreactors, and I stick it in a room, and I'm, I'm ready to go. So it's a lot more scalable, potentially more consistent. Again, my cells are just producing the one thing that I want. I don't have to worry about dozens, hundreds of compounds that the cannabis plant's producing. And it's more continuous. It's not like I have harvest to harvest every month. I could be growing cells for a, a couple days at a time and getting cannabinoids out of it. What are the downsides? Huge upfront R&D cost, right? Massive upfront R&D cost. And there's regulatory issues. How is this regulated under medical marijuana laws? Is it regulated under, like, where does this even fall? Are you, would you be allowed to sell this over the counter? Marketing issues, consumers clearly would be weirded out if you know, your vitamin was brought to you by some bug in a bioreactor. And what about all the other potentially beneficial compounds in the cannabis plant, the so-called entourage effect? Will you be able to recreate that? And I'll talk about more on that issue later. Okay, let's talk about the cost considerations because that's probably one of the biggest advantages of this technology. So these are, some, these are some prices of commonly used over-the-counter compounds you can buy that are produced by microorganisms. And it looks pretty cheap. 10 to $50 a kilo for 
This is basically fish oil, penicillin, and a commonly used vitamin. These are microorganisms that they're using to produce these. So you look at the cost and you're like, holy shit, for a kilo? That's really cheap, right? So clearly this process, over the last 50 years that we've been you know, designing these uh, bacteria or microorganisms, is we can get the price down pretty low. All right, now let's talk about uh, beta caryophylline right? It's a terpene found in the cannabis plants, also found in things like black pepper. You can buy naturally derived, relatively pure beta caryophylline depending on how much quantity you can buy, anywhere from 20 to 150 bucks a kilo. You can also buy synthetic beta caryophylline and it's cheaper. However, that, just the fact that synthetic beta caryophylline exists and is cheaper than the naturally derived beta caryophylline, it did not completely take down demand for natural beta caryophylline. That's because the makers of herbal products or fragrance companies, they, a lot of them self uh, you know, affirm that they only want to source from natural products. So the, the, the appearance of a cheaper synthetic source did not just end the discussion. Even though these are commodities, these are fungible things. The, the beta caryophylline is going to do the exact same thing, whether it's derived synthetically or naturally. Ooh, this, uh, there's a lot of stuff here. Okay, whatever. So let's talk about, let's compare uh, CBD versus uh, what biosynthetic CBD might look like. The reason I choose CBD derived from hemp is that's probably what the cost of THC would also look like if marijuana cannabis were allowed to be grown you know, outdoor 10,000 acres at a time. So whatever price point that we can kind of theoretically arrive at for CBD, that is one day what THC will look like too once it's grown at scale outdoors as you kind of see happening in countries like Colombia and stuff. Um, and so what you find is that you could get the price down from anywhere from tens of dollars to hundreds of dollars per kilo of substantially pure CBD derived from hemp grown at scale. How did I arrive at that number? If you look at uh, opium, opioids, so a, a, a lot of the opioids that we still use in the pharmaceutical sector are actually derived from opium plants grown in places like India. And, they, and then they go and they extract out the active compounds, purify it, and put into a pharmaceutical pill. And that, those opium products, uh, they sell, uh, even though they're naturally plant-derived, they sell for you know, tens, of, tens of dollars per kilo, maybe $100 per kilo. And that's when they're grown at large scale and you have a full supply chain to back it up. So again, approaching that price point, it would look very similar to what we see with opium. On the biosynthetic side, you're also gonna get in that range, and that's because you can look at many other biosynthetic compounds that are sold in the nutraceutical sector uh, that approach that similar price point, that have similar chemical structures to cannabinoids. But now keep in mind, this is, you know, I, I'm not gonna pigeonhole myself and give you a narrow estimate, because then I, in a few years, I'll look bad if it's Roth, right? So just don't, don't ever predict anything in public, is what somebody taught me. So I'm giving you a huge range here, um, but I want you to see that it's comparable. Right, and that uh, there's a good chance that you know biosynthetic could be five times cheaper, maybe more. Right, depending on where in this range it falls. Now, if you're talking about deriving it, deriving cannabinoids from the plant, clearly CBD is going to be the first cannabinoid to reach an incredibly low cost because of wide-scale hemp. Then it'll be followed by THC eventually. As for the other minor cannabinoids, I don't know if we'll ever get to that point just because the current supply of cannabis genetics, you don't have plants that are 25% THCV or CBG or all of this. So for the minor cannabinoids, I don't, it's probably not gonna get to this price point. It's probably gonna be significantly higher. And so for the minor cannabinoids, I think it's highly likely that biosynthetic will be kind of the reigning uh, way to produce uh, the minor cannabinoids. And that's because it's, it's gonna cost the same, whether you're trying to produce THCV or THC in terms of the biosynthetic realm. It just, what you're changing is the, the, you're slightly modifying the DNA sequence that you're putting into the cells, depending on what cannabinoid you want to produce. So, if, if you're talking about just pure individual cannabinoids and the biosynthetic process can trump the plant derived on, on cost alone, is it, is it game over, right? These, are, these things are commodities, they're identical, and if you look at traditional uh, economics, whenever you have commodity pricing and 
you know, the, the price points go down to where nobody's making any profit. And so is that the case? Well, I think, I think there's another possibility we haven't explored yet that's gonna give, it's gonna give the plant some, get up Rocky, get up Rocky, come on. So I think the plant, the plant has still got a shot. The plant's still got a shot, I'll tell you why, okay? So here's why. We, can get, we haven't gotten very creative with ways to grow the plant or ways to change the, the metabolism of the plant and how it produces these cannabinoids. So there's one company, uh, Trait Biosciences, and what they have, or what they're working on figuring out, they've already filed some patents, but what they are trying to get the cannabis plant to attach a sugar molecule to the cannabinoids that it produces. And by attaching a simple sugar molecule to the cannabinoids, they suddenly become water-soluble. That has many implications. So first off, you're gonna get higher yields, and that's because now that the cannabinoids are water-soluble, they can exist throughout the plant. They're not just stuck in the trichromes uh, on outside of the plant. Extraction becomes a lot easier too. Remember what I said, extraction's expensive because you're trying to grab for the cannabinoids but you end up grabbing all the other things that have similar chemical properties, the fats, the lipids, other cannabinoids, flavonoids, et cetera. If you have one cannabinoid in your entire plant that's water soluble, you, you, you don't even need to use like ethanol and stuff. You could, you could do a water extraction, right? And lastly, potentially ease of formulation. Uh, if the cannabinoids are already water soluble, they'll mix better into beverages, they might even absorb, well, they probably will absorb better as well into your body, okay? And so, <clears throat> the other really interesting kind of game-changing piece, oh, and this is the company, Trade Biosciences. Oh. Uh, and so, uh, another really interesting implication of this is that because you're no longer beholden to the trichromes, you're also no longer beholden to the flowering of the cannabis plant. So you could theoretically, yeah, you could theoretically just take the plant and veg it and you can just veg it all day. All day, you're just vegging the cannabis plant. You, it grows up a couple, you just cut it down. It grows up, you cut it down, it grows up, you cut it down. How, how many years have, have you had maybe mother plants last for? Years, years. You don't have to worry about you know, nursery, clone, uh, take it to flower, then the whole thing dies, and I do it all over again. You just have one room that every couple weeks you harvest and you never need to throw it into flour. You don't need light deprivation. You don't have to deal with any of that. It's because the, it, the cannabinoids are being abundantly produced throughout the plant. Again, now whether they can actually scale this technology is one thing, but they've, they've uh, managed to do it at small scale and file some patents around it. Next one. Okay, let's talk about the effectiveness um, of all of this. Uh, so again, whether it's synthetic or it's natural, it's gonna do the same thing, okay? The real question is, what else is actually in the plant? So CBD is a good example where you hear people say, CBD from cannabis isn't as effective as CBD from hemp. The CBD is the same, it's gonna do the same thing. The real question is, what else is accompanying the CBD? If you're, if you're talking about a hemp product, it's not gonna have a lot of THC, right? And so let's talk about the, this notion of, of whole plant. And so this is a study where they gave mice pure CBD and they measured inflammation. The higher the bars are, the more inflammation there is. So what they found was at a low dose of CBD, you still had a lot of inflammation. At this middle dose of CBD, you lowered inflammation. As you increase the dose again, the inflammation returned. Right? So this is not good. There's a very narrow window of efficacy. So if you're dosing a patient, that's not good. That was done with pure CBD. Then they did the exact same study with a high CBD extract. And they matched it so that both mice got the same amount of CBD, but this group got all the other stuff that came along for the ride with the whole plant extract. And what they found was that the more you gave of that extract, that you had a nice reduction in inflammation without that rebound at the end. So again, what's going on here? We're not quite sure. What compounds in the extract are responsible for this arguably superior dose response curve? We don't know. Okay, that's the mystery that we gotta tease apart. Here's another study where they took breast cancer cells in a Petri dish and they applied THC, pure THC to one and they applied a high THC extract to the other. Uh, and what they, what they found was that, yes, the pure THC was able to inhibit some ca cell, cancer cell growth, but the high THC cannabis extract, 
at the same level of THC was able to have significantly more anti-cancer effect. And again, is it of the dozens or hundreds of other compounds present in the cannabis extract, which one's responsible for this increased effect? Is it two of them? Is it 20 of them? Is it 200? You know, that's what we're trying to figure out right now as a scientific community. All right, last thing, regulatory considerations, and I'll open up for Q&A. So there, there's a big mess right now over marketing of, of um, food products. Like people throw out terms, you know, no, no artificial ingredients, all natural, all this stuff. A lot of those labels aren't well regulated right now. Like the FDA doesn't have an official definition of what is actually all natural. However, despite that, despite there being unclear regulation, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, has independently gone after companies and sued them because they made an all-natural claim that was interpreted as deceiving the consumer. So now you start talking about if you were, if you were able to derive cannabinoids from other sources, would you ever be able to claim that your product was all-natural, no artificial ingredient, anything like that? Right? What does that landscape look like? Uh, and also, people have gone around, lawyers will go around filing class action lawsuits against companies that inappropriately label as well. So it's not just the government cracking down, it's individual groups of lawyers who will organize class action lawsuits against companies. Um, and so you're saying, you know, over half of consumers are motivated to purchase by the all natural claim. That trend's not going away anytime soon. Uh, and, and soon, in the next couple years, the FDA will finally define what it actually means to be all natural on a product label. So then we'll actually have some strict rules and guidance. Uh, Frito-Lay recently pulled the all-natural claims on their products, waiting for, until the FDA officially uh, puts in its ruling. So again, the, the companies are taking notice of this. And I think a couple years ago, Subway dropped all artificial ingredients uh, from their food, um, including synthetically made versions of naturally occurring compounds. So they went with the slightly more expensive natural uh, produced compounds. So again, this is a trend that's not going away. All right. So, Last thing to think about is, depending on where you source your cannabinoids, it might impact where you're able to sell it, okay? So if you are deriving CBD from cannabis, uh, you'll be able to sell it into the cannabis space. That's clear. But if you're, and when I say cannabis, I mean marijuana cannabis, not hemp, right? Uh, if you're deriving CBD from cannabis, you probably won't be able to sell it into the nutraceutical space. Right? It's highly likely that the cannabis, uh, anything produced in the cannabis ecosystem is going to stay sold in that highly regulated system. And it's possible you'll be able to sell it into the pharmaceutical sector in a very regimented fashion. And that's what GW Pharmaceutical does. They grow cannabis in the UK, they extract out the CBD, purify it, drop it in some oil, and sell it as Epidiolex, which was recently FDA approved. So that's a possible viable path. What if you're deriving your CBD from hemp? Okay. So probably you're not going to be able to sell it into the cannabis space, and that's because the cannabis industry has its own kind of protectionist uh, measures that they can take. Um, you probably will be able to sell it, depending on which government uh, jurisdiction you're in, into the nutraceutical sector, and you probably will be able to sell it into the pharmaceutical sector, and you are seeing uh, pharma companies that are getting ready to source hemp-derived purified CBD for drug trials. But this is, this is clearly probably not going to happen because you have all of these cannabis businesses that are like, we paid all this money, taxes, now you're going to let hemp CBD be sold you know, and mixed into cannabis products. Um, that doesn't seem fair, right? It's going to drop, uh, it's going to put downward price pressure on us. And now for the last one, biosynthetic CBD. Where does this fall? Let's play a game, actually. All right, what do we think? Are, we, are they going to sell it into the cannabis space? Yay or nay? No, probably not. For the same reason, self-protectionist measures. Um, there's jobs at stake, right? So now, now that all these states have jobs, they're like, are we going to suddenly replace all these jobs on these farms now that we're going to allow this stuff? Uh, what about the nutraceutical sector? What do you guys think, yay or nay? Yeah. It's question mark, right? There's other examples of biosynthetically made products that do exist in nature, but made by bacteria that are sold in vitamins and supplements. That does exist, right? So it's possible, depending on how regulators decide to allow it. What about biosynthetic CBD for the pharmaceutical sector? That's probably the most relevant use case. Um, and these guys want really, really, really purified product, right? Um, so that probably makes the most sense. So key takeaways, and we'll wrap it up. Uh, the biosynthetic route is going to be cheaper, most likely, 
The, the one area where it might be comparable is maybe hemp-derived CBD, because just you could grow that so large scale and industrialize it. But for all the other cannabinoids, biosynthetics probably going to win on cost, uh, especially for the minor cannabinoids. Um, there is clear evidence of an entourage effect, and, that, and therefore you might not get that if you're just producing one single compound biosynthetically. Consumer perception of what your compound is clearly is important today. It will continue to be important going forward, and now there are regulations coming in to actually define what is all natural. How is that going to impact uh, that? And the source of where your cannabinoid is likely going to impact your permissible sales channel. So as you can see, there's a lot of considerations at play as to what the future of cannabinoid production, you can leave that there, will look like. So in terms of wrapping this up, in, in the game of cannabinoids, is it, you know, is it more like you know, a civil war where like it, the US Civil War, we just lined up troops on each side and you just kind of like hit at each other all day long until one side gives up, right? You're just competing on cost. Who can, who can, what's the race to the bottom? I don't think it's like that. I think this game is more like Game of Thrones, yes. Right, where it's like, there's a lot, there's like subterfuge and you have like spies and like they have an army of like knights but you have like dragons and there's like magic and, and, that's, and that's because there's so many factors at play. Cost is one consideration. We talked about cost, we talked about effectiveness, we talked about consumer perception, and we talked about regulatory permissible pathways for sales. So. That is how I see the game of cannabinoids, and I'll open it up for Q&A. So we have hand in the back up first, then boom, then over here. Uh, excellent talk, very thought-provoking. Um, any idea about how you see this uh, being given to patients? Is it going to be patch, oral? Uh, and can you comment a little bit about formulations and bioavailability? Great question. So uh, I, I think oral is probably not going to be a great way to deliver cannabinoids for a very medical purpose, and that's just because the the, the rate of the, the absorption is so variable uh, and it's so erratic. And so that's where things like some sort of a um, oral, uh, either some sort of sublingual delivery or oral mucosal delivery could be interesting. Uh, transdermal uh, could be a very interesting route that's very standardized and stable, and. It's interesting, I actually think there's a role for inhalation in some form, definitely not combustion, but maybe some form of vapor, vaporization or some form of aerosolization. And that's because it's just a very consistent, quick, easy way to deliver cannabinoids. But I think in terms of oral, just like take some cannabis extract, put it in a pill, I don't think that's ever gonna be uh, what, a, what a, a medical product would be recognized as, just because it's too, it's too um, inconsistent in its effect. Thank you. Um, questions about CBD products and label claims versus maybe drug claims of delivery um, and efficacy and maybe onset. And in your opinion, is that a safer way for a company to, to you know, uh, kind of tra like uh, go through their operations as opposed to what happened like Cureleaf recently where they had to rescind a lot of their uh, claims on CBD and hemp. And I think, you know, that has a lot to do with the PDLX sure. as you were saying. Yeah, so the reason you can't make any claims on CBD is because it, it's, it's an FDA-approved pharmaceutical drug. And so, you know, uh, you can't make any sort of, you can make wellness, I mean, this is true of any nutraceutical, you can make like wellness claims. So rather than like treats your insomnia, it's like for a good night's rest, right? That's kind of how you have to phrase stuff. Um, so yeah, so, so, and yeah, so the short answer is disease claims, no, it's not gonna be possible. It won't be possible for THC either because THC has been FDA approved since 1986 in the form of Marinol. 50, yeah, uh-huh, yeah. So um, you have to stay away from disease claims unless you're willing to go down the pharmaceutical drug development pipeline, Andrea. But, but as opposed to like the, uh, maybe the drug delivery claim or the onset claim of the actual. Oh, drug delivery claim, drug onset claim. That's interesting. Um, that is a little better. You have a little more leeway there. Like, for quicker onset, use our dissolvable yeah. tablets. That, you have a little more leeway there because you're not making a disease claim. So, um, something different. Uh, so, excellent talk, but I think it's interesting that you were looking for a single winner when you clearly defined in your talk three different channels to sell in. So, 
I can see a world where there's three winners, but, and I can see more than that because, as you said, the abundance of certain cannabinoids and other compounds in the plant is different, and so you're right. You, so can you see a world where there's, there are winners that are different in each of the commercial channels, and how much do you think the government, so for example, for the pharmaceutical channel, how much do you think the FDA's perception of these compounds influences things? Because as a drug developer, I'll, I'll let you know that my paperwork is significantly uh, less complicated if I use a synthetic homolog of something. Yeah, so to answer your first question, clear, like, clearly you could, you could very quickly be like, all right, anything derived from cannabis is gonna float around in the cannabis industry. Anything derived from hemp will just go nutraceutical, and then all the synthetic stuff goes pharmaceutical. But like I said, there's a ton of crosstalk. You have pharma companies who are willing and ready to source synthetic, uh, uh, hemp-derived CBD, um, and, that's, and GW Pharmaceuticals, the one company that has an FDA-approved CBD, they grow the cannabis plant themselves, and they create extracts from it. So there's tons of crosstalk. So I think it would be a bit too, it wouldn't do it full, justice to just do with those three lanes. Now, in terms of what you said about perception, yeah, it makes it a lot more difficult when you're trying to go to the FDA and say, hey, you know, approve my drug. I guarantee you it's gonna be consistent batch to batch for the next 50 years. Oh, and by the way, I like derive it from a plant and I take it through all these purification and extraction processes. Um, that's, that's kind of foreign to them. Uh, and they have a lot more scrutiny over those processes. They wanna make sure you're growing the plant identical each time and that you can reliably reproduce that. So it does add considerable difficulty. Uh, can you speak to the uh, various CBD formulations and how they'll work with uh, food products? Uh, oh, so can you, can you clarify the question a little more? Well, um, the, the government seems to be at odds about whether it's going to allow CBD into food products, right. and it's going back and forth. So I'm just wondering if these various CBD formulations uh, ha have a relevance. Oh, I see. Yeah. So the only, the only shot of you selling CBD into the, as a food product, aka a dietary ingredient, is if it's derived from hemp. That's the only basis you have any ground to stand on, period. Don't even talk about anything outside that's not going to be allowed. The FDA actually is perfectly correct when they say you cannot sell CBD in food products. And that's because as soon as CBD entered clinical trials with GW, they created basically a moratorium. And that's why you can't sell this stuff in the food product. It's a pharmaceutical drug. GW staked its kind of flagpole on it. So it's, it's, it's actually very clear that that's not the case. Now, because the FDA is under so much political pressure, from all of the folks who backed hemp as a way to revitalize rural communities, predominantly Republican rural communities, that's why the FDA is now willing to make a concession um, because of this intense political pressure on them to allow CBD so that the hemp farmers can actually grow a valuable crop. This has nothing to do with you know, them. It's, it's all economic development of these rural communities. That's the driving factor behind these conversations right now. In terms of the formulations for the food products, um, yeah, it's really, it's the hemp-derived stuff that's going to be there. You're, I mean, going forward, here's likely what's going to happen is the FDA will come in and say, okay, here's the maximum amount of CBD you can put into a pill or a bottle. Uh, it cannot be overly purified beyond this percentage. So keeping it more of a hemp extract as opposed to a pure CBD, which that's clearly a pharmaceutical drug. And maybe you have to go through these testing labs that we've done some uh, we've given them a license to certify that your CBD product is accurate. I suspect that's somewhere where the FDA might fall in the coming months and years as they figure out the regulation. We have one more question. So Hi, she, Jeff. She's, oh, okay. Hi. Uh, great presentation. Thanks. Uh, question is, um, have you seen any studies that, you know, we're talking about reintroducing terpenes and the entourage effect. Have you seen any studies that, that deal with the increased or decreased efficacy of uh, of terpenes when they're reintroduced versus naturally occurring? Uh, short answer, no. And that's only because we haven't, there's literally, I could count on one hand the number of studies that have compared pure cannabinoid to cannabis extract head to head. So we don't even really know if the entourage effect, if it's like how real it is or like when it actually occurs. And we don't even, we remotely understand and start comparing, you know, a, uh, uh, a hemp extract versus one that was like fractionated and then reconstituted into a specific combination. We're not, we're not there yet. I will say though, uh, Didi Marie out of Israel has done some studies 
where he takes a whole extract, cannabis uh, extract, and he'll sequentially break it into chunks. And what he's trying to do is to arrive at the minimum amount of compounds from that full extract that recreate the full extract's effects. And in one particular cancer cell line he was looking at, he found that it came down to four. It was four ingredients that he isolated that when combined could recreate the whole plant extract. But that's for these cancer cell lines. Maybe for other disorders, you need less, maybe you need more. So. I was just curious if uh, you know of any pharmaceutical companies uh, growing cannabis so that it will have a higher uh, amount of minor cannabinoids. You were talking about that may be the future. Yeah, so it's not so much pharmaceutical companies. To my knowledge, there's only like one pharmaceutical company growing cannabis, it's GW. I think all the pharmaceutical companies now are just gonna work with and purchase their cannabinoids from uh, uh, cannabis companies. Predominantly right now, Canadian cannabis companies because they're creating kind of like the cleanest, most pharmaceutical grade stuff. Uh, in terms of your question, which was uh, minor cannabinoids, yes, it's, it's not so much pharma companies, it's all these cannabis genetic companies, breeders, they're all scrambling to get uh, these rare genetics that have high amounts of these minor cannabinoids. And it's because, you know, what is a, what is a kilo of CBD isolate sell for right now? $5,000? What is a kilo of CBG isolate sell for right now? Or THCV, 100 grand, 50 to 100 grand, right? It's that much more valuable because it's so rare. So um, yeah, so it's really the breeders, the plant breeders and genet genetics guys right now are scrambling to find those genetics. They realize how valuable it is. Okay, all right. Great, thank you guys. Thank